the War on the War of the Worlds, and this is the second book of two, and there's only about five or six more chapters left here, so looking for another book to do that's in this same genre, and if you have any suggestions, I'm totally open. Um, so this is going to be chapter three, which is titled The Days of Imprisonment. Is the title. So let's get started. Is everybody sorted? And let's see, let's set this up to be herbs. I don't hear all these notifications. Do not disturb. There you go. Alright, so back to Kindle. Alright, so chapter three, the days of imprisonment. Everyone ready with their drinks and such and getting comfortable? Alright, let's get started. The arrival of a second fighting machine drove us from our peephole into the scullery, for we feared that from his elevation the Martian might see down upon us beyond our barrier. At a later date we began to feel less in danger of their eyes, for to an eye in the dazzle of sunlight outside our refuge must have been blank blackness, but at first the slightest suggestion of approach drove us into the scullery in heart-throbbing retreat. Yet terrible as was the danger we incurred, the attraction of the peeping was for both of us irresistible. And I recall now with a sort of wonder that in spite of the infinite danger in which we were between starvation and still more terrible death, we could yet struggle bitterly for that horrible privilege of sight. We would race across the kitchen in a grotesque way between eagerness and the dread of making a noise, and strike each other, and thrust and kick within a few inches of exposure. The fact is that we had absolutely incompatible dispositions and habits of thoughts and action, and our danger and isolation only accentuated the incompatibility. At Halliford, I had already come to hate the curate's trick of hopeless exclamation, his stupid rigidity of mind, his endless muttering of monologue, Vitiated every effort I made to think out a line of action, and drove me at times, thus pent up and intensified, almost to the verge of craziness. He was as lacking in restraint as a silly woman. He would weep for hours together, and I verily believed that to the very end of this spoiled child of life thought his weak tears in some way efficacious and I would sit in the darkness unable to keep my mind off him by reason of his importunities. importunities. He ate more than I did, and it was in vain I pointed out that our only chance of life was to stop in the house until the Martians had done with their pit, and that in long patience a time might presently come when we should need food. He ate and drank impulsively in heavy meals at long intervals. He slept little. As the days wore on, his utter carelessness of any consideration so intensified our distress and danger that I had, much as I loathed doing it, to resort to threats, and at last to blows. That brought him to reason for a time. But he was one of those weak creatures. Void of pride, timorous, anemic, hateful souls, full of shifty cunning, whose face neither God nor man, who fa whose face not even themselves. It is disagreeable for me to recall and write these things, 
but I set them down with my story that it may lack nothing. Those who have escaped the dark and terrible aspects of life will find my brutality, my flashes of rage, in our final tragedy, easy enough to blame. For they know that is for they know what is wrong as well as any, but not what is possible to tortured men. But those who have been under the shadow, who have gone down at last to elemental things, will have a wider charity. And while within we fought out our dark, dim contest of whispers, snatched food and drink, and gripping hands and blows, without in the pitiless sunlight of that terrible June was the strange wonder, the unfamiliar routine of the Martians in the pit. Let me return to those first new experiences of mine. After a long time, I ventured back to the people to find that the newcomers had been reinforced by the occupants of no fewer than three of the fighting machines. These last had brought with them certain fresh appliances that stood in an orderly manner about the cylinder. The second handling machine was now completed and was busied in serving one of the novel contrivances the big machine had brought. This was a body resembling a milk can in that its general form among the oscillated above which oscillated a pear-shaped receptacle, and from which a stream of white powder flowed into a circular basin below. The oscillatory motion was imparted to this by one tentacle of the handling machine. With two spatulate hands, the handing, handling machine was digging out and flinging masses of clay into the pear-shaped receptacle above while the other arm, it periodically opened a door and removed rusty and blackened clinkers from the middle part of the machine. Another steely tentacle directed the powder from the basin along a ribbed channel towards some receiver that was hidden from me by the mound of bluish dust. From this unseen receiver, a little thread of green smoke rose vertically into the quiet air. As I looked, the handling machine, with a faint and musical clinking, extended, telescopic fashion, a tentacle that had been a moment before a mere blunt projection, until its end was hidden behind the mound of clay. In another second, it had lifted a bar of white aluminum into sight, untarnished and yet untarnished as yet, and shining daz dazzlingly, and deposited it in a growing stack of bars that stood at the side of the pit. Between that stood at the s between sunset and starlight, this dexterous machine must have made more than a hundred such bars out of the crude clay and the mound of bluish dust rose steadily until it topped the side of the pit. The contrast between the swift and complex motions of these contrivances and the inert panting clumsiness of their masters was acute, and for days I had to tell myself repeatedly that these later latter were indeed the living of the two beings. The curate had position, possession of the slit when the first men were brought up to the pit. I was sitting below, huddled up, listening with all my ears. He made a sudden movement backward, and I, fearful that we were observed, crouched in the spasm of terror. He came sliding down the rubbish and crept beside me in the darkness, inarticulate, gesticulating, and for a moment I shared his panic. His gesture suggested a resignation of the slit, and after a while, my curiosity gave me courage. I rose up, stepped across him, and clambered up to it. At first, I could see no reason for his frantic behavior. The twilight had now come, 
the stars were little and faint but the pit was illuminated by the flickering green that came from the alumin aluminum making it's it's felt like the british do aluminium which is kind of hilarious um the whole picture was a flickering scheme of green gleams and shifting rusty black shadows strangely trying to the eyes over and through it all went the bats heeding it not at all the sprawling martians were no longer to be seen and the mound of green blue powder had risen to cover them from sight and the fighting machine with its legs contracted crumpled and abbreviated stood across the corner of the pit and then amid the clangor of the machinery came a drifting suspicion of human voices that i entertained at first only to dismiss i crouched watching this fighting machine closely satisfying myself now for the first time that the hood did indeed contain a martian as the green flames lifted i could see the oily gleam of his integument and the brightness of his eyes and suddenly i heard a yell and saw a long tentacle reaching over the shoulder of the machine to the little cage that hunched upon its back then something something struggling violently was lifted high against the sky a black vague enigma against the starlight and as this black object became, came down again i saw by the green brightness that it was a man for an instant it was he was clearly visible he was a stout ruddy middle-aged man well dressed three days before he must have been walking the world a man of considerable consequence i could see his staring eyes and gleams of light on his studs and watch chain he vanished behind the mound and for a moment there was silence and then began a shrieking and a sustained and cheerful hooting from the martians I slid down the rubbish, struggled to my feet, clapped my hands over my ears, and bolted into the scullery. The curate, who had been crouching silently with his arms over his head, looked up as I passed, cried out quite loudly at my desertion of him, and came running after me. That night, as we lurked in the scullery, balanced between our horror and the terrible fascination this peeping had, although i felt an urgent need of action i tried in vain to conceive some plan of escape but afterwards during the second day i was able to consider our position with great clearness the curate i found was quite incapable of discussion this new and culminating atrocity had robbed him of all vestiges of reason or forethought practically he had already sunk to the level of an ant but as the saying goes i gripped myself with both hands it grew upon my mind once i could face the facts that terrible as our position was there was yet no justification for absolute despair our chief chance lay in the possibility of the martians making the pit nothing more than a temporary encampment or even if they kept it permanently they might not consider it necessary to guard it and the chance of escape might be afforded us i also weighed very carefully the possibility of our digging our way out in the direction away from the pit but the chances of our emerging within sight of some sentinel fighting machine seemed at first too great and i should have had to do all the digging myself the curate would certainly have failed me it was on the third day if my memory serves me right that i saw the lad killed it was the only occasion on which i actually saw the martians feed after that experience i avoided the hole in the wall for the better part of the day i went into the scullery removed the door and spent some hours digging with my hatchet as silently as possible what but when i had made a hole about a couple of feet deep the loose earth collapsed noisily and i did not dare continue i lost heart and lay down on the scullery floor for a long time 
having no spirit even to move. And after that, I abandoned altogether the eye of escaping by excavate. It's as much for, my, for the impression of the Martians had made upon me, that at first I entertained little or no hope of our escape being brought about by their overthrow through any human effort. But on the fourth or fifth night, I heard a sound like heavy guns. It was very late in the night, and the moon was shining brightly. The Martians had taken away the excavating machine and save for the fighting machine that stood in the remoter bank of the pit, and a handling machine that was buried out of my sight in a corner of the pit immediately beneath my people, the place was deserted by them, except for the pale glow from the handling machine and the bars and patches of white moonlight the pit was in darkness, and except for the clinking of the handling machine quite still. That night was a beautiful serenity, save for one planet. The moon seemed to have the sky to herself. I heard a dog howling, and that familiar sound was what made me listen. Then I heard, quite distinctly, a booming exactly like the sound of great guns. Six distinct reports I counted, and after a long interval, six again, and that was all. End of chapter three, and we'll be coming next week, next Thursday, for um, chapter Thursday, and we'll be moving on to chapter, excuse me, chapter four, which is titled "The Death of the Curate." So, hopefully, I'll see you then, and I hope everyone has a good evening and stay safe. And talk to you later. See you later.